Okay, okay. So <laughs> after a little rough start, <laughs> it will. This will be a funny, very funny story to tell uh, in the pub after pub will be open again. Okay, so uh, today we'll talk about uh, Gestalt principles and data visualization. And um, uh, thank you for joining. And before we, I will introduce myself. Uh, so for those of you who do not know any Germans, so let me just explain you what uh, Gestalt principles are. So Gestalt is in German for unified whole. And these are the principles which uh, describes how human eye perceive visual elements, how we make grouping and how we, how we, how we analyze what we see in the world. And the person who uh, promotes this uh, term uh, have a quote that the whole is other than the sum of the parts. And we will talk about that in a moment. Okay, so a little bit about me. So uh, I have a PhD in statistical genetics. I was actually even doing bioinformatics for a few years. And currently I'm working as a freelance data scientist, as uh, Peter already told, uh, together with my husband, we are doing courses. And I'm actually just returning from my second maternity leave. So I'm open for new projects. And you may hear my little baby crying time to time. So I apologize for that. So one of the latest projects on which I was working was um, Atlas Chehu from Behavio. This is a research tool for the marketers. I really recommend you to look at this tool, even if you're not a marketer yourself, because uh, there are some data analyzation for uh, 1,000 Czech people. And you can see, for example, what common characteristics do have people who drink Kofola, for example. And the second uh, latest project on which I was working, and I'm currently working on that, is a HR chatbot, and it's um, um, Arnold HR chatbot for, for which I was doing data uh, visualization and data analysis. And uh, I think that now we can make a polling if, uh, um, if Peter can make a polling. So you have uh, two patterns here, and you need to decide which pattern is random either pattern on the left or pattern on the right is random. So usually I make this talk offline and um, when I'm asking people, so there are several of the people who say that it's uh, a pattern on the, the pattern on the left, the square on the left, but the right answer is that it's a pattern on the right. So um, if you look uh, of the square on the left, you'll see that there is some repulsion between patterns and it, between particles, and it definitely is not random. And um, a pattern on the right has some um, some structure, which, as many of you know, is quite natural for the random data. But we, as a people, we are trained by evolution to see and to rationali rationalize the patterns. So uh, why am I showing it here? Because uh, visualization, if you are not guiding your audience uh, enough, you can make a different conclusion or you can, st you can find some, um, some pattern, even if it's not there. And the, better, the best example of that, in my opinion, is uh, this situation which happened during the Second World War when Abraham Walt was working for the U.S. Army and he was cataloging uh, bullet holes in the planes that were returning to, uh, to, to US in order to make an armor. So in ideal case, you would make a lot of armor on the, on the, the whole area of the plane, but the plane will be very heavy. So you need to choose wisely where to put armor. And so when Ab Abraham Walt made it and his supervisor looked at this image, they said, okay, so we clearly see where we need to put the armor. So it's where the most bullet holes are. But when Abraham Walt looked at the same visualization, he made a completely different conclusion. And now it's called survivor bias. So he said, we're analyzing only planes that are coming back to US. So we do not have any bullet holes analysis 
of the planes which are not returning. And actually, maybe it's the other way around. We need to put more armor into areas where there are no bullet holes because they are so crucial that if there are bullet holes there, that uh, the, uh, the, the, pers the plane cannot uh, return back to US. So this is how you can make a different, um, different conclusions from the same visualization. And okay, so uh, we were talking about the three steps, roughly, that uh, uh, the person who is looking on the plot um, is using. So first is a question, then there is some exploration, and then there is an insight if there is some relationship or um, uh, any similarities, differences in, in, the, uh, in the data. And you may say that well, there is no anything terrific in, in the data to think about it, but I think that it's not right. And here I will quote Edward Tuft, who is a very key person for infographics and for a, a lot of uh, graphic, graphic of data visualization. And he said that if the numbers are boring, then you've got the wrong numbers. So definitely, uh, if, you need, if there must be any takeaway from this presentation is that you could have a mindful moment with your data just to think what is the message that I want to uh, give to my, uh, to my audience, to the clients, and then make a visualization with that. So uh, before we'll start actually with, uh, with uh, uh, the principles itself, I will talk a little bit about uh, char junk, which is a term proposed by Edward Tuft also. And Edward Tuft was talking about some data to ink ratio that you need to minimize the information which does not contain um, data. So here on the top, you see the, um, the diamonds graph, and then you can see the same plot on the right. So uh, he, I think that it's not so straightforward and categorical. So all depends on what your um, aim or your focus is. If you are somewhere and you need just to catch attention, maybe some non-data ink is very good because look at the scatter plot that you have here. You definitely saw like hundreds of them, but the um, graphics on the left, even though you will not remember the relationship itself, will catch your eye. But if we will look on the graphics uh, on the bottom, it's definitely a char junk because there is a lot of information. And when you are doing such visualization, you are losing precious focus time of your audience. So the person does not know where to focus the information, where to focus. And there's just a lot of different colors, different symbols. This is just too much. So uh, um, in order to, um, like to, to move, to our principles, but before we'll move, I would like to show you uh, the power of visualization. Maybe some of you know unscombed data, where uh, the data have the same mean, the same variance, but they look completely different. And there's even a better data set is Datasaurus. And this is a data set where you have the same X mean, the same Y mean, the same standard deviation, and the same correlation but the data look completely different. So let us wait for the, for the dinosaurs. I like it a lot. Uh, so here you can see the power of visualization. When you look only on the numbers, there is not enough of information, but when you visualize your data, you see the clear difference there. So when we are talking for Gestalt principles, I would like you to look at the images before because um, if you will Google Gestalt principles, you will find a lot of material for designers, for logo creators, because it's not so much about the data visualization, but much more about art. So uh, here's our, uh, the work of the artist Octavia Ocampo, who um, is using Gestalt principles a lot in his visualization. So in this uh, image, you will see butterfly, flowers, and maybe you will see the a woman face. Here you will clearly see the woman face, okay? So on one hand, you first see the flowers, then you will see the woman face. Uh, the same is here. So here you see a lot of horses, and here you see one horse in the front of a lot of different horses. 
And the last one, my favorite one is here you see the lady with a basket uh, of uh, bread loaves. And if you make it slower, you clearly see the skull. So all of these um, uh, images, they're working with Gestalt principles. And actually the Gestalt principle of uh, skull that you see here is the first one, it's simplicity. So when, um, hum when human looks at the visual elements, he sees them in the simplest form. And what it is for us, this knowledge is that when you um, are plotting any data, try to reorganize them if possible. So there is some simple form. So if you look on the plot on the left, then you see some uh, bar plot. And there, so some bars are lower, some bars are higher. Um, but you can reorder this bar plot. So it's more like um, the fo form is more simple. So instead of comparing different bars, here you see the clear form that you see that the C is the lowest and the B is the highest group. Um, so actually the uh, idea of these principles will be that I will show you first the plots, then I will talk a little bit about principle, and then I will show you some logo. So um, as I already told, with simplicity principle, you need to arrange data logically whenever possible and data that make the simplest form. So here the simplest form of triangle. And here there is um, a logo which used this principle, it's logo of Unilever. So you see the U, only if you pay more attention, you will see that there is a DNA strand, B, there is a snowflake and so on. So first what you see is U. And even though this is not U, this is the shape which looks like U, but composed with a different, uh, uh, different objects. The next principle is proximity, which uh, is that if objects are close to each other, they're perceived as one group. So um, if we want to use this uh, principle, we can look at the graph on the left and you see that there are different box plot and we want to uh, make groupings. We want um, for our audience to see that box plot of group A and group D are kind of part of the one group, uh, one bigger group. So what we can do is we can reorder them and we can put them closer to each other. So if we reorder them and put like that, the human or the audience will uh, definitely perceive these two box plot as one group and these two box plot as another group than in the image on the left. So, as I said, elements that are close to each other, they're perceived as one group. As, and as an example, here I have a logo of IBM where uh, the horizontal bars are close to each other, so they're perceived as, as a letters, I, B, and M. The next, um, the next principle is similarity and this is the graph that I was uh, showing a few uh, moments before. And here we also are making grouping. So I already was talking about changing the order. So put the group A and group D together. So they're per perceived as one group. But also I used similarity principle. I make the box plot look more similar. So here, if you look at this image, each group has a different color. If I want to enforce that there is some two major groups, then I can use proximity principle and I can also use similarity principle. So I can make the box plot looks more similar. So here I'm using the same color. So here is green and here is blue. And yeah, next, um, Example is with a scatter plot. So here um, I'm using a similarity in the way that I'm distinguishing bef between groups. So here are all of the points looks as a one blob, but once I'm using the different color and different shape, 
here we see that there's clearly one group and these two groups are perceived as one group even though I'm, use, I'm using different color and shapes the proximity of the points that they're close together we see them as one group and what we can also do is uh, we can use similarity principle in the other way around when we were, want to emphasize differences so here i want to emphasize different that this point is different from the other so i'm um, i'm making another size so i'm increasing the size and i'm making this point a different color so I'm emphasizing the difference between this point and the rest of the graph. Okay, so as I said, similar objects are perceived as one group. So we can use color, size and shapes either to promote grouping when we use the same color, size and shape, or we can use different color, size and shapes to promote, to emphasize differences. And here as an example, I have a logo of NBC. So even though these are the different objects. They're perceived as a one object as the peacock um, tail here. Next principle that uh, I want to talk is continuity. And it is that if the object are following into one direction, they're perceived as one group. And how we can promote direction in data visualization, we can put a line or a curve here uh, we are making um, a linear model fit so we're putting the guide um, the guideline here and so these two groups even though they're not the same completely but they're quite similar and this group is per perceived to be another group like different from them because we see the differences in directions okay so the groups that the point there that are followed in direction, they are perceived to be one group. And here as an example, we can see the, the next, so we follow the direction. And so the last uh, principle that I will be talking about in um, uh, um, data visualization is figure and ground. So when we as a human look at the graph, we immediately um, detect what is ground, so the thing that we can ignore, and what is figure. And this is the thing that we need to focus on. So in order to guide your audience, you need to make as much contrast as you can between figure and ground. So uh, there is uh, not any ambiguity between, between what, what is figure and what is ground. You can see here as an example on the graph on the left that there is not so much contrast and it's much clearly visible to distinguish between groups an example on the right when there is much more contrast there and as an example i um i wanted to show you this uh, logo of some cabins where there is a play with a figure and ground so first you see the deer and then when you per perceive deer as a, uh, as a ground, you see that there is a cabin there. And because we are talking about contrast, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, color vision, how it's, how, we, how it's organized in humans. So in, this is an image of a human or a, a illustration of the human eye. And in the back of the eye we have a retina when there is um, two different types of cells ones are rods which are used for the motion detection and when there is a low uh, light level and another are cones there are three different types of them here they are in red green and blue and these cells uh, actually uh, detect different color different wavelengths of the light and using and because of them or thankfully to them we are perceiving different colors so we of the human have three different type of detectors and maybe some of you recognized what is this little creature it's a mantis shrimp that has a 12 different color detection so we even do not know how what the colors are there the uh, the shrimp itself is very colorful creature and um, 
uh, I definitely uh, recommend you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, so uh, mantis, uh, mantis shrimp, uh, I definitely recommend you to Google mantis shrimp because it's used all the 12 detectors to, um, uh, to, for furious fights for territoriality. So when uh, we look at the, um, at the color perceiving for in case of color blindness and normal color, so, um, here on the top, you see uh, what uh, what is the uh, what uh, what looks uh, normal um, for the normal eye, normal healthy. I was no color blindness. How the images look like, and here uh, we'll see uh, the um, in case of difference uh, different color blindness. So in case of different color blindness, uh, one of the detector either is completely missing or the cells are, um, there is not enough of cells or they are malfunctioning somehow. So, um, uh, if you are thinking about um, how many population uh, has color blindness, it's about 8% of the male population. It's rarely, very rarely in, in female, uh, because of the hereditary, because it's located on the X chromosome and female has two X, so there's some of the genetics there. So uh, here you can see the normal uh, uh, vision, and here you can see how it is in the different types of uh, color blindness. So what does it mean for you as a data scientist? You can use color blindly, color blind friendly palette. For example, Veridis palette, which is um, default color palette for a Matplotlib uh, Python package. Or you can use combination of colors and shapes. You saw in the scatter plot I was using uh, in one of the scatter plot I was using both shapes and colors. Or if you are um, if you are uh, plotting bar plots, you can use different patterns and colors and definitely avoid uh, green and red combination. Okay, so let's us re let re recapitulate all the principles that we were talking, and then we will look at the some examples. So we're talking about simplicity, that human will perceive the simplest uh, form possible. Then we were talking about proximity, that the two points together are perceived the points together are perceived as one uh, group. Then there is a similarity where the points with the same characteristics or the objects with the same character characteristics like shape, size, and color are perceived as one group. Then there was a continuity where, uh, where the points um, um, share, uh, follow one direction, they're perceived as one group. And then there was a figure on ground where um, human detects what is ground, so the thing to ignore, and what is figure, the thing to focus. So now when you look on this example, you already see that there is um, a principle of figure and ground with the lady. So if you either uh, see the lady with a basket or you see a skull, and there is a simplicity and proximity principle where you either see a little uh, bread uh, loaves or you see the skull. Okay, so uh, before we start with some examples, and the thing that I need re that I want really to emphasize is that uh, when you are making any graphs, you need to focus on what do you want to show. So, do you want to show similarity? Do you want to emphasize differences, or do you want to show relationship? And also, then decide, knowing that principles that we already covered. What can you use to enforce similarity or enforce difference? Will it be same shape or different shape? Size, color, order, or lines? Okay, now let's look to uh, examples. So we will be using data from World Happiness Report, which has a questionnaires for 156 countries. When they're asking citizens of that uh, countries, 
how do they perceive themselves to be happy and then it also defines key factors for well-being so how um, generosity contributes to the happiness health economy and so on i was using data from 2015 to 2019 and there is a link on kaggle and um, all the uh, graphs that i was showing you before and then i will show now are uh, on my uh, github repo so you can look at it afterwards okay so first example is i was looking at happiness score and how economy uh, contributes uh, the, the wealth uh, contributes to to the happiness score so when i plotted this uh, graph i see that there is clearly a relationship so this i want to emphasize so I want to show a relationship between happiness score and um, the GDP, and I will use different color and lines. So here is the final result. So I made the points look less contrast. So I want the audience to concentrate on the line. So there is a clearly um, relationship there, linear relationship. So I made a linear uh, fit. And, I, and in order to emphasize that uh, line, I made a um, confidence interval of that fit. And because this is not official presentation, I wanted to put um, the question as the title of the graph. So the, uh, the people who are looking at it, can, they have a question, so they can explore the graph and answer, more money, more happy or no? The next example uh, is with a box plot. So here are different regions and how uh, in that regions, how do health, um, um, health uh, factor contribute or the life expectancy contribute to the happiness score. So here I wanted to um, make a grouping. So I see that there is a sub-Saharan Africa, which is kind of um, differs from the other countries. And then there are some, um, highly developed countries. So I want to emphasize that there's actually three different groups. Um, so I want to show similarity of health effect for different regions and I will use Corolor for that and I will reorder my data. So here are the diff here are, here is the, uh, the final result. So I reorder the box plot so you can clearly see um, three different groups um one group the green uh, yellow and orange and then there is again the title more healthy more happy so audience can decide and so now there is a third example i was looking at the happiness score and how generosity contributes to it and now you can see clearly that there is one point which is outstanding from the other so i wanted to emphasize it so what I want, I want to, to show difference of one country in generosity. What does it mean? So in one country, people think that in order to be happy, they really need to be generous. And what I will be using for that, I will be using color, size, and shape. And here is the result. So again, I make the less contrast for the point. So I want my audience to focus on this point, that it's far away from the other point. And in order to really enforce it, I wanted to label it. So it's Myanmar. And again, there is a question, what is the most generous country in the world? And when I Google it, it's really like that. So Myanmar is like for a lot of years, is one of the most generous country in the world. And there are different speculation why it's so. Uh, one of that is that there is a lot of uh, Buddhist monks there and Buddhists has a, they have a saying that attention about generosity, that attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. So I thank you for your generosity. I thank you for your attention and sorry for the technical complications. So uh, still free free to add any questions uh, to Slido slash Slido slash MLMU and you can add any question and we'll go through that but in the meanwhile before we get hopefully more 
uh, there is the first one, which is, uh, is there any Python library that would keep Gestalt principles in mind by default? For example, suggesting good color palette or pre-designed charts, etc. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, I can definitely recommend. So if you will look at the, there will be my slides available, and if you will look at the code, so I recommend uh, Seaborn, which is actually kind of wrapper for Matplotly uh, package, when there is really very nice graphs and nice uh, color, uh, color uh, selection. But even if you use Matplotly, it's, it has colorblindly palette, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Then we have another question, which is, what is your favorite data visualization? Okay, so um, as, a, as a data scientist, I, so I tell about my least favorite visualization, so it's definitely um, pie chart. But my favorite visualization are, well, it depends. So um, uh, I, I think that data visualization is an, an art and I sometimes can, like, if the visualization is really important, I can spend like a day tuning it uh, and maybe more. So I think that it depends. It really depends on what I want to show. But I, I like box plot. If I can can make it like one visualization, I like box plot a lot. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a uh, third question, which is what is present of Gestalt psychology? What happened there in the last 20 years? Okay, so, um, I uh, do not know how to answer on that question because I'm definitely not uh, um, an expert in uh, Gestalt psychology whatsoever at all. I only, uh, what inspired me uh, for this presentation is that uh, I sometimes noticed, I don't know, like several years ago, uh, an article about Gestalt principles in data visualization. So, um, I do not know. So the answer, I do not know. And I don't think that there's actually anything new. It's just there is a new approach how to use it for data. So if you Google it, there is not so much for the data. It's much more uh, for uh, logo creation. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we had uh, another question. What is a good alternative for pie chart? <laughs> okay, so th thank you for, for asking. This is a really very good question. So what you can do with a pie chart, you can do with a bar plot. Everything that you can do with a pie chart, you can do with a bar plot. And the problem for the pie chart, so I didn't, uh, maybe some of you don't know, is that uh, when you have a circle and you have a different parts in the different place, so there you couldn't, if you have only two categories, you can use pie chart. But if there are more than three categories, uh, two categories, there's very hard to make comparison. That's why we're using bar plot. So bar plot. Okay, thanks. Let me see whether we have, okay, good. Could you recommend any blogs, books to follow, read that you find interesting in the area of data visualization? Uh, so definitely a uh, book, Beautiful Visualization from Edward Tuft. So if you will Google Edward Tuft, then you will find uh, some beautiful visualization is his book, which is really very nice. He has a history of uh, different visualization and that book I really recommend. Good, thanks. Uh, what is your favorite geo visualization tool? Is Python enough or is just Power BI better? Um, so I start with the comparison. So I never used Power BI, so I do not know. And for geo visualization, actually, this is kind of funny. You can look at my GitHub uh, profile. And if you will look at my repositories, you will find that on last, uh, I think it was last PyCon, last check PyCon. I was doing, uh, together with my husband, we were doing a workshop when we were doing, uh, for, we were visualizing uh, geographical visualization with Plotly or we were using Leaflet. So actually, my answer to that would be, uh, I would make a, a POC in Python, but if it would be some visualization 
on the website, I will use JavaScript. This is actually what I did in my work. But if you ask for the Python, it will be a leaflet, um, um, a leaflet uh, library. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question is, uh, is there any connection between the Gestalt uh, approach you showed and the use of metaphors in data visualization? Mm, I do not understand the question. What does mean the use of metaphors in data visualization? Uh, maybe the person who was asking that, if he can uh, unmute himself and uh, say a little bit more about the question. Uh, Vojta, uh, Vojta, I have just unmuted you, so if you want to uh, make the question. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I just recently read, read some uh, some articles about the uh, use of metaphors uh, when visualization data, like uh, uh, big is important, or uh, I think it's, it's, it's a uh, in a way, it's similar to to this. Uh, mm, okay. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This, but going a bit farther, farther in a metaphoric sense, not just taking things literally, but using metaphors. That, that's what I mean. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Huh? Yeah. So um, I do not actually. When you uh, say it, I, I realize that I'm using it. Even do not know that there are metaphors. So when I'm doing some visualization, I'm. Mm, uh, very carefully selecting the, the colors. So I definitely recommend to using metaphors uh, together with Gestalt principles, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have one more, which is, is there any deep learning algorithm that would recommend the best visualization method for my data? Um, I do not know about any any of of such uh, such no maybe if you know mark about any algorithm or tool <laughs> not, not really maybe uh let me ask a bit simpler on this uh, sorry for <laughs> uh using this uh, opportunity but is there any cookbook or something like that? I mean that uh, there would be a, let's say, simple website that would tell you if you are going to uh, yeah. um, communicate I, I, it, then box plot and using uh, this kind of style would be the most suitable. Um, I, I do not know about any, any, anything like this. Yeah. Maybe maybe just like uh, read some data visualization book and but um, yeah that Edward Taft that I that I was uh, that I was recommending. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next next question is: uh, Do you do all your visualizations in Python or do you use another tool to? So uh, it depends on what projects I'm working. So if the client want it in Python so I either was doing it in Matplotlib static visualization or I was doing in Plotly um, interactive visualization or uh, just a moment I will take my dog or I was uh, doing uh, in R then I will definitely use ggplot for that or um, I'm, I was using uh, Plotly in JavaScript so it really depends on what project I'm working. But if I will do something for myself, I will be, do, I will, I will be working in Python. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe let me address one thing here. Uh, yeah. I don't know if Andre is uh, online or not, but uh, just to explain what happened, we were just so careful about any, uh, any intruders, because for those that came a bit later, we had some issues at the beginning, so uh, we were just, uh, let's say, uh, too careful and coincidentally uh, kicked off Andre from the, from the presentation. And uh, like the bad thing is that it uh, locks him out for, for a minute. So, so sorry to Andre and uh, to all of you for the inconveniences at the beginning. Uh, I hope we learned a lot from this. So, uh, so. And we wanted to address this at the end of the Q and A's, but uh, so uh, do you guys have any more questions, or let's move to the networking part? 